Well, good evening to you, and thank you very much for welcoming me here. I'm excited to spend some time with you talking about discipleship and worldview and raising children. Uh, between the pastor and myself, we'll have one good voice. Um, he, he's got a cold, and I had surgery on my vocal cords about three weeks ago, so they're still healing, so forgive me for not having the same oomph that, that I would like to have, but I've got the heart for it, so we're going to go. You know, it's, uh, it's an interesting time to be alive. It's a difficult time in some ways to be alive, but I also think it's, it's an, a, a very exciting time to be alive if you're a Christian, if you love Jesus. What a time of opportunity. But, you know, you look around at what's going on in the world. How many, how many of you are familiar with an online magazine, a Christian satire magazine called The Babylon Bee? Any of you? Oh, good. Oh, this is good. I love some of their headlines because I think they really nail what's going on in our culture. And as I was preparing for tonight, there were a few recent headlines they've had that I thought really spoke to the kinds of issues that our, our country is facing. Uh, you know, one of uh, those particular headlines was parents take Gen Z kid who doesn't have anxiety or depression to therapist to find out what's wrong. You know. <laughs> Uh, you know, or interest in drag queen story hour wanes after their more accurately renamed man wearing lingerie wants to spend time with your kids hour. <laughs> uh, there is another one, you know, church that believes exactly what the world believes, not sure why no one bothers coming to church anymore. We've got a lot of those around America. Or church puzzled by low attendance at its sit around and talk about your feelings men's conference. <laughs> Yeah, I, I missed that one myself. Uh, yeah. Female runner not feeling great about her chances against the girl with the beard. So, you know, yeah. And that kind of speaks to what we're, we're addressing in our culture these days. I think we could raise the question of why is America struggling so profoundly with so many issues that if you're a follower of Christ, if you're someone who reads the Bible, these things seem so black and white. But elements such as, you know, our confusion about is there truth? What is truth? When does truth matter? Political corruption, uh, you know, what constitutes that? What do we do about it? Financial irresponsibility, not only on the part of the government, but on the part of families and individuals the ineffectiveness of so many churches, the decline in our population, first time we've had that since our nation came into existence, stability in our families, what, what's going on there? We don't have that kind of stability these days. Lawlessness is everywhere. Addiction, it seems to be omnipresent. Our, chi our children in the public schools are constantly being indoctrinated into other ways of thinking and believing. The sexual confusion, the identity issues that people are wrestling with, the fact that nobody trusts our institutions anymore, which had been one of the foundations of our nation. All of these things, what are we supposed to make of it? Why do we have these problems and what are we gonna do about it? And I think that's why it's so great to be a Christian these days because we have the answers that the world is looking for. But if we have those answers, why doesn't the world catch on to it? And I wanna to suggest to you that part of the problem we're wrestling with is that when you look at any particular culture, that culture is essentially defined, it's described, it's comprised of the cumulative choices of the population in that culture. It's their choices altogether that actually make that culture what it is. And if our nation is in a state of deterioration, it's because of the decisions that the people in that culture are making. And so when you look at all of that, you've got to understand that every person in the culture, every hour of every day is making decisions. And when you put them together, you get the culture. So what that says to me is that there's one simple understanding of this, which is that 
if you don't like what's happening in the culture, you've got to change the decisions that we're all making. I mean, that, that, that does, that's not brain surgery to figure that out. And, and in fact, the scriptures have already taught us this. You go back to Galatians 6. In verse 7, Paul wrote to us that you reap what you sow. And that's what our culture has become. We don't like what's going on. Why? But we've sown these seeds for years now. And we're simply reaping what we've already sown. But, you know, if bad decisions are the things that lead to outcomes that we don't want in our midst. What do we do about it? Well, first we have to question why do we make those decisions? How do we get in that place where so many people are making so many bad decisions? How, how are we gonna change that? And I think one of the primary answers to that question of how did we get in that situation is because the people who, influencing, uh, who influence us are championing and modeling unsound philosophies. They're making decisions based on philosophies that are untenable, and that cannot help but lead to those untenable outcomes. Their influence prevails, why? Why are there so many of these people? Because there are not enough genuine followers of Jesus Christ demonstrating their influence to the rest of the culture for people to follow us. Americans do not want to fail. We hate failure. But when we're posed with no other alternatives, we'll accept it. Who has the alternative? The disciples of Jesus have that alternative but there are not enough of them who are living their faith, who are in the culture spreading their faith, and they are demonstrating what it looks like. When Jesus gave us what we call the Great Commission, uh, you know, that passage at the end of the book of Matthew, where he talks about the fact that we're supposed to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but importantly, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands that he has given. See, this is what we are on the planet to do. We've been seduced by our culture to think that we're here to be successful, we're here to be happy, we're here to be popular, we're here to have as many toys as we can accumulate. We've been seduced into thinking something that is patently false. If we go back to what our Father in heaven through his Son Jesus has told us to do, it's to be here to represent him and to influence the rest of the world. The problem that we have today, one way I said it, is that we do not have enough disciples in our culture who are influencing others. A different way of saying it is, right now, the culture is influencing the church of Jesus more than the church of Jesus is influencing the culture. And if we want America to survive, if you want your family to thrive, if you want your church to have the freedom to continue to love and honor and respect and worship Jesus, if you want to live the life that God put you here to live, then you have got to be a disciple of his who's willing to go out in the world and influence it for his glory. You say, well, George, you know, you stand there and you're beating us up right off the bat. You know, how do we know that what you're saying is true? Because I do research. So let me show you some of the things that I've discovered. All right. We talk about disciples. There are a lot of different ways that people think about disciples. I'll get to that in a few moments. But one of the things that, that I've begun doing, one of those next three books that I'm working on is, how do you effectively disciple Amer uh, adults in America today? And so I've been doing a lot of research over the last four years on that. I recently put out a book called Raising Spiritual Champions about how can we effectively disciple children? And I'm gonna get to that. That's the most important thing we can be doing. But as I look at this whole enterprise of discipleship in America, I started looking at some of the research, some of the facts that we have about what's going on. And what I've discovered is that in America today, only somewhere between two to three 
50% of adults in America can be defined as disciples of Jesus. Two to three percent. Can you imagine that? In this nation where 64% of Americans call themselves Christians, only two to three percent of them meet a series of criteria, very simple criteria, that might begin to define them as disciples of Jesus. Criteria like, uh, you know, uh, believing that the Bible is God's true and reliable words that should influence our life. Believing that the Bible should be our primary moral guide. Uh, being born again, not calling ourselves that, but actually being people who recognize that we're sinners, that our only hope is Jesus Christ, and therefore we've acknowledged that we're sinners before God. We've told him that we're sorry for those sins. We've asked him to forgive us for those sins. We've asked him to send Jesus, to allow Jesus to cover us with his blood so that we can live eternally with him. And in the meantime, we're promising that we're gonna turn our lives around. We know that sinning hurts God, and we don't wanna do that anymore, so we're repenting, which is what that means, turning your life around, doing things differently. Uh, you know, what else does a disciple do? It's uh, someone who reads the Bible every day, someone who would spend time every day praying to God, listening to him, trying to discern through his word and through your communication with him, what do you want from me today, Lord? I'm committed to it, whatever it is. I will go there, I will do it, I will pay the price no matter what it is. Pursuing his will in your life. Every day, taking time to thank and praise and worship God for his greatness and his goodness. Uh, being someone who is consistently pursuing obedience of all the principles that Jesus taught us. We're not gonna get it perfect, but we're intent on trying to become a little bit closer to that every single day. Individuals who would say that the only reason why we're on the face of the earth has nothing to do with us, it has only to do with God. He created us for his purposes and his purpose for you and me is that we would know, love and serve him with all our heart, mind, strength and soul every moment of every day. And a disciple is someone who would try to avoid sinning all the time because we know that that breaks God's heart we know that that doesn't advance his kingdom. It's not part of his agenda. So, I mean, these aren't, you know, things that you've never heard before. You know all this, I know all this, but are we living that way? Only two or three percent of American adults are. See, as I've been doing the research, what I discovered is we still feel pretty good about ourselves because we've been able to convince ourselves that there's a different way of thinking about what a disciple is. And in interviewing thousands of people across the country, I've heard all kinds of definitions of what a disciple is. I ask them, what do you think it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And, and you can see the things up on the screen there that people have told us in huge numbers. You know, well, I'm a disciple of Jesus because I'm a good person or I'm a disciple of Jesus because I go to church every week, or I'm a disciple because I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, forgetting that even the devil, Satan himself, believes in the existence of God and Jesus. That hardly makes you a disciple. You know, I'm a disciple because I read the Bible, because I pray to God, because my parents were Christian, I was raised in a Christian home. Now, I'm gonna say to you that that is none of those are adequate or accurate descriptions of what a disciple is. But again, you might be sitting there, the skeptic, the questioner saying, but George, how do we know that you're right? How do we know that those are wrong? Well, what do we do when we have a question? What do we do when we want to figure out what decision to make? That's what tonight is about. How do you make the right decision, right? So how do you do that? You go back to God's word. Why? Because it is the truth. God himself is truth. And he encoded that into the Bible so that a bunch of ninnies like us would be able to read that and figure out how to get it right. He knows that when we're left to our own devices, we're gonna get it wrong. So he gave us the guidebook. 
And so when we go back there, what are we going to find? We're going to find that Jesus himself defined for us what a genuine disciple is. What other definition will we want but the one that Jesus gives us of who is my disciple? And what, what fascinates me is in writing that book, Raising Spiritual Champions, I read literally dozens of books on discipleship in preparation for writing. Uh, I was telling Noah before, when I write a book, I don't sit down and take months and months to write it. I get an idea. I spend about six months not writing anything, but just thinking about it, praying about it, reading the scriptures, waiting for God to prepare me to write the book. And then my wife says, when the time is right, I explode a book. And, and in about two weeks, I just sit down, I clear my schedule, write the entire thing. At the end of two weeks, it's done. And generally, I never look back at it. It's like, okay, the Lord used me to do that. What's next, Lord? And so in doing this, I wanted to fill my mind with, okay, what have other bright, godly people learned about discipleship? And so I read the, you know, the classic Christian books on discipleship. I read a bunch of books on discipleship nobody's ever heard of. I read all kinds of stuff. And you know what I did not find in any of those books? What I'm about to share with you now, which is how did Jesus define disciples? That blew my mind. I mean, it, it's, it's right there in, in the red letters in the book. And so you look at that, and what did Jesus say? You will be my disciples if you obey my teaching in John 8. John 13, he said, you will be my disciples if you love the other disciples. In John 15, he said, you will be my disciples if you produce much spiritual fruit. In Luke 14, uh, three times he talked about discipleship. And in the first one, in verse 26, he said, you, you cannot be my disciple unless you love God more than anything and everything else in this world and in your life. And then a verse later he said, and you cannot be my disciple unless you pick up your cross and follow me, which meant in that Roman context, unless you submit to the prevailing authority. What's the prevailing authority on earth? God himself. So you cannot be his disciple unless you submit to God. And then a little bit later in that same chapter, he finished it up by saying, you cannot be my disciple unless you surrender everything you have to be part of God's kingdom and to follow him. That's what a disciple is, pure and simple. And so we look at that. And by the way, do you notice that those criteria that I talked about measuring before, now do you see where I got them? It's from the definition that Jesus has given to us. I'm not making this stuff up. Trust me, I'm not, okay? I don't want to be answering to God for that. But then there are some other things that I've discovered in doing this research that, again, help give us the fuller context of why we only have 2 or 3% of adults in America who can be considered disciples. One of those is that only 4% of adults in America possess a biblical worldview. 4%. I'm gonna talk extensively about that in a few moments, so just hold on to that thought. But then there are other correlations. Why does that matter? Because first of all, what I find is seven out of 10 adults who have a biblical worldview actually qualify by those standards that Jesus gave us as disciples. So a biblical worldview is critically important toward becoming a disciple of Jesus. You wanna be his disciple, develop a biblical worldview. The, the other side of that same coin strengthens that argument because then we also find that only 1% of adults who do not have a biblical worldview qualify as a disciple. 70%, 1%. Which route are you gonna take? You don't have to have a PhD in statistics to figure that out. What you want to do is develop a biblical worldview. Now, when we start talking about becoming a disciple, what is a disciple in practical terms? Well, in practical terms, a disciple is someone who lives like Jesus, right? He is the one that we are trying to emulate. We want to imitate his lifestyle, his choices, the decisions that he made. So, to live like Jesus, what do you have to do? Number one, 
You've got to think like Jesus. Why? Because every decision you make, first of all, you're going to think about it. And it's your worldview that's going to help you make that choice. So you've got to think like Jesus, but why? Well, keep in mind, we do what we believe. You do what you believe. And you say, well, how do we know that? Because if you didn't, you would be incapacitated. You would be constantly wrestling with cognitive dissonance where you believe one thing and do something else and you feel bad about yourself. You feel inconsistent. You feel uh, like you're not making a difference, like you don't know who you are, what you're doing. Your life would be a total mess. There are some people like that. But generally what you want to do is uh, carry through your beliefs into your behavior. You do what you believe. You're internally consistent. Now, you could still be wrong because your thoughts, your beliefs might be off and then your behavior is going to be off. And do you know what we call that? American society. And so that's what we've got to change. See, those of us who are in here who are disciples or who are trying so hard to be a genuine follower, a genuine disciple of Jesus, that's our task, is to transform the society with God's truth, which is a series of beliefs that then get translated into behaviors that honor and glorify him and advance his kingdom. That's our job. That's why we're here. And so a biblical worldview enables you to become a true disciple of Jesus because you're thinking like him and because you think like him, then you have a high probability of behaving like him. Why? Because you do what you believe. So let's take a step back and talk about this notion of worldview. Because I've assumed that you all know what it is, which is silly because I've done the research and I know that most of you don't. So what is a worldview? A worldview is something that everybody in this room has. In fact, everybody on the planet, apart from kids under the age of two or so, everybody has a worldview. You need one to get through the day because your worldview is the intellectual and emotional and spiritual filter that you take with you into your daily existence. It's the thing that enables you to experience and to understand and to interpret and then respond to the world around you. You've got to have some basis on which to make your decisions. And that's what your worldview is. It's that body of information that allows you to take action. So everybody has one. What we know is that your worldview is critical toward discerning who you are. It's critical toward figuring out what matters to you and how you live and how you view reality and how you are going to contribute to society, positively or negatively. See, the concept of worldview is neither positive nor negative. What makes it positive or negative is which worldview you choose to embody. And we'll get to that in a moment. But your worldview is the sum of your beliefs and the resulting behaviors. Every decision that you make, no matter what kind of decision it is, big or small, flows through your worldview. You can see a lot of the kinds of decisions that, that you make. But understand that your worldview is the cause of what goes on in your life. Bad choices are just the symptom of the worldview that you've developed. And so as we look at this, realize that every day you're faced with many, many choices, many options, a lot of alternatives about what kind of decisions you can make. And the decisions you make as an adult typically are the ones that conform with the worldview that you've already embraced. You see, because by the time you reach adulthood, your worldview is already formed. I'll get to that in a moment. But the key here is to understand that what you have probably done, 
like most Americans, I'll show you the numbers momentarily, is you've been exposed to dozens and dozens of different worldviews. And what you've done is you've, you've sized them up and you've tried to figure out which ones would work best for me? Which ones make me feel most comfortable? Which ones make the most sense to me? And so you've begun then to put together all these different ideas from a whole parcel of different philosophies of life. See, most Americans don't choose a single philosophy of life. What we do instead is we take bits and pieces from many of them and we put it together into a custom blend that becomes your personal worldview. In most cases, it's unique to you because the way that you've put it together is a little bit different than the way that everybody else puts it together. One of the worldviews that you can choose from is something called biblical theism. That's another way of saying the biblical worldview. That's what I'll be referring to it as. But in essence, a biblical worldview is a way of experiencing and understanding and interpreting and responding to the world based on biblical truth. Rather than relying on ideas of men, what you do is you rely on the ideas of God. A biblical worldview enables you to become a disciple of Jesus because it's a biblical worldview that parallels the thinking of Jesus. It's the thing that allows you to think like Jesus. And because you do what you believe, then you can act like Jesus as well. But look at all of these different worldviews. You've been exposed to all of these. We, uh, at, at the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University, where I work, one of the things that we do at the beginning of every year, we're the only place in the world that does this, we do an annual national survey with a representative sample of a large group of Americans to figure out what is the worldview of the American population. That's how I came to that 4% people, 4% of adults in America have a biblical worldview statistic based on that annual study that we do. But we measure all of these different worldviews. And what we find is that most Americans have elements of many, many worldviews in their customized worldview, the worldview that they've developed for their own life. There are very, very few people I've ever interviewed, and we've interviewed tens of thousands of people about their worldview, very few who have a pure biblical worldview. Even some of our great Bible teachers in America have elements of other worldviews because a lot of these different philosophies of life are very seductive. They're very subtle and we don't even understand when we're embracing them. Sometimes they're embraced by so much of the culture, we confuse cultural acceptance with biblical truth. We assume that, well, everybody believes it. It must be right. It must be true. It must be appropriate. And because we're generally a Christian people, or so we think, it must coincide with biblical truth, when in point of fact, that's not the case. So we've gotta be very careful about anything that we let in our minds. You know, we ask dozens of questions of people to get at their worldview. You know, we can look at a lot of different things, but just to give you an example, if you were to take something simple, such as asking people, what are the forces or the beings that constitute an important guide for their life. What you would find is that the different worldviews offer you different answers to even such a simple question. Now, a disciple of Jesus would say, well, there is no God but the God of Israel. You know, Jesus, you know, the Son of God, these are the only real gods that we have before us. But if you were to talk about Islam, they would talk about Allah and Muhammad. If you were to talk to 
uh, you know, people who have bought into Wicca, they would say, well, the horn god or the, the uh, triple horn god, you know, that is, that is the only true god. You could talk to Mormons and they, they have multiple gods that they would point to. Eastern mystics, you know, would uh, say, well, the universe, but in point of fact, there are actually thousands of gods that come under the universe. You know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And before you know it, you've got this entire slate of confusing and contradictory information. And so what do most Americans do? Do they run back to the scriptures and say, oh my gosh, what does God teach about this? Sadly, no. What most Americans do is they say, oh, what answer makes me feel good? I mean, I've literally found in our research that that's how most Americans put together their worldview, based on their emotions. They're turning inward as if they are the source of truth and they can discern which way to go. Don't do that, folks. Very, very dangerous. It will mislead you. You know, when we do our national studies, I mean, we actually break out people's worldview into eight different categories of, of information, of, of beliefs and behavior that we measure. And all of those are spoken to in Scripture so we can figure out what a biblical worldview has. But here are the actual numbers. Currently in 2024, this is our most recent data. Uh, we recently completed this. What we find is that uh, only 4% have a biblical worldview, 2% have a Mormonistic worldview, 1% have a secular humanist worldview, 1% postmodern, 1% nihilistic. You've got 2% combined among uh, seven different worldviews, Marxism, Eastern mysticism, moralistic therapeutic deism, Judaism, Islam, Satanism, Wicca, and animism. Look at the bottom of that chart. Do you see that long green line going across there? That's most Americans, more than nine out of 10 Americans. 92% are adherents of syncretism. How many of you have ever heard of syncretism? Anybody? Yeah, a few. Most people have never heard of it. Syncretism basically means that you take a lot of disparate elements, you combine them into something new. And that's what we do to develop our personal worldview in America. That's what most Americans are doing. 92% of Americans. You say, but, but George, George, come on. You're here in a Christian church, a church that believes in God, a church that teaches the scriptures. This is a church that's got it going. So don't, you know, okay, yeah, the culture's a mess, but, you know, the church in America, come on, man, it's in good shape. We just have to get out there more, right? Mm. Let's look at some more data. If we were to look at all of the people who regularly attend evangelical or Bible-believing churches, only one out of every eight of the adults in those churches has a biblical worldview. If we were to look at people who, theologically speaking, we could characterize as born-again Christians, meaning they're not just people who call themselves born-again, but they're among the 32% of adults who say that when they die, they know that they will go to heaven, but only because they've confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. If we look at that group, again, only one out of every eight of them have a biblical worldview. We could look at the parents of children under the age of 13. Only 2% have a biblical worldview. We can go down through that whole list. Let me just jump down to the bottom there. And apart from your church, because I know this church is an exception, I wouldn't be here if this church were an example of those bottom two numbers. But in, across America, if we look at Protestant churches and their senior pastors, only four out of 10 of them have a biblical worldview. And I would say most important number on that particular page is the bottom number. Among children's pastors in churches in our country, only 12% have a biblical worldview. My friends, that is frightening. Russia's got the bomb, China's got the bomb. It's not nearly as frightening as that number to me because this is taking America down. Those bombs may never be exploded on American soil. I pray to God they're not. 
but we've got a much bigger bomb that is exploding in our culture every single day, and that's it. If we look at what's happening with worldview over the last 30 years that I've been measuring it, there's been a 75% decline in the proportion of Americans who have a biblical worldview. And one of the questions that, that I was asked by somebody at some place I was speaking was, why don't we ever hear about this? It sounds like a crisis. It is a crisis. Why don't we hear about it? Let's take the case of people who regularly attend Christian churches. What we find is that about two out of three of them believe that they have a biblical worldview. When in point of fact, among those regular attenders of Christian churches across the country, only 11% have a biblical worldview. We've lulled ourselves to sleep thinking that I'm not the problem. It must be somebody else. When in point of fact, we are the embodiment of the problem. And so what do we do about this? Let, let me suggest to you there are a number of things that we can talk about. One of the important elements related to this is the fact that a person's worldview begins developing at 13, excuse me, at 15 to 18 months of age and is pretty much fully formed by the age of 13. Your worldview was formed before you became a teenager. It had to be because all the decisions that you were making, you had to come to a conclusion on all the different things you were facing. And so eventually you developed your worldview through experience, through observation, through teaching, and many other things. But by the age of 13, a person's worldview is complete. Does it change after that? Not much. We did a longitudinal study related to worldview, tracked people over the course of 30 years of their life. What we discovered is that most people die with essentially the same worldview they had at the age of 13. It doesn't change very much. This is one of the reasons why when I go to churches, I ask them to consider their ministry model. You know, there, there's this saying that insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. It's kind of what we're doing in the church in the sense that what we do is we take almost all of our resources and we pour it into us, adults, thinking that it's gonna make a difference. Well, if who you become and how you live and whether or not you become a disciple of Jesus Christ is determined before the age of 13 in more than 90% of cases, then wouldn't it make sense to invest most of our time and energy and money and every other resource we have into reaching children? Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't minister to adults, but it means that we should be ministering differently to them. And in point of fact, the adults should be doing most of the ministry, not staff that we pay at a church. But you and I need to be in the marketplace ministering primarily to children, to each other as well. I mean, we could talk about models, but, but the key here is to recognize that reaching children is the key to not only bringing health to the church, it's the key to saving America. Because remember, if, if what we're saying is that our culture is deteriorating because of the bad decisions that people make in that culture and that they're making those decisions on the basis of their worldview and their worldview is developed before the age of 13, you can fund all the government programs you want. It's not going to turn our nation around. What you need to be funding is the spiritual development of children between birth and their, their 13th birthday. If you do that, you have a great chance of turning around the culture. If you continue doing what we're doing now, which is investing in ourselves and thinking if we drag the kids along to church with us and throw them in a program, it's all gonna work out great, we will lose this country. I can guarantee it. There's no other possibility other than God supernaturally intervening. 
Would he? Maybe. But he shouldn't have to. That's why we're here. It is to be his hands and feet getting the job done for the kingdom of God. And so we know that, you know, people go through different phases of their worldview experience. But it's that first phase where, where young children are absorbing lessons and information and experiences and they're experimenting with different ideas and philosophies and ultimately they wind up establishing what they believe to be true and right and proper and appropriate and that determines their worldview. That determines how they're going to live. Frankly, that determines whether or not they're going to be a disciple. And so, you know, we look at the fact that based on the research that I've been doing the last few years, we know that less than 1% of preteens and teens in America are on track to develop a biblical worldview. Less than 1%. Now, as best I can tell, it's never been that low in American culture. Obviously, we haven't had this kind of research, but I've worked with David Barton and some others to try to go back into historical documents and understand what the, the spiritual temperature of the nation was at different points in our history. I can't find any time when it's been this dire. We have to, you know, look at the fact that even though so many of our churches are claiming that they're doing a great job in discipleship, so many of our parents are saying they're getting the job done at home, the evidence tells a different story. See, and it's important because statistically it's very uncommon to find someone who is a legitimate, genuine disciple of Jesus who doesn't have a biblical worldview. And so I would say strategic wisdom dictates that we must be investing the bulk of our resources into children. But where does that start? It starts with parents. It doesn't start here in, in a congregation. It starts at home. Why do I say that? Because that's what Jesus said. That's what God teaches us in the scriptures. That it's the parent's job to do it. Go back and read what he talks about, for instance, in Deuteronomy 6, where he outlines how we're supposed to be interacting with our children. How often, what kind of discourse, what kind of experiences. You know, there are all kinds of things that the scriptures teach about biblical parenting. It's imperative that we understand those things in terms of discipline, in terms of teaching, in terms of values, in terms of beliefs, in terms of uh, lifestyle choices. The scriptures speak to all of that for parents and children. But do we know what those things are and are we complying with them? You know, my advice to every parent is that we've got to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to help our children develop a biblical worldview in order to maximize the probability of them becoming a lifelong disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not gonna, be ha it's not gonna happen because you hope it happens. Forgive me for saying this, it'll sound blasphemous. I don't think it is, I, I pray it's not. But your children aren't gonna be disciples if you simply pray that they become disciples. You've got to put some feet behind the prayer. You've got to do your job in raising those children that God entrusted to you for the express purpose that they become followers of Jesus. Praying is critically important, but in and of itself, it's not enough. Why does all of this matter? Keep in mind that our children are a target. Maybe not so much within the church, but outside the church, our children are being targeted all the time. I mean, you know this from marketing of products, right? But take it even a little bit deeper. Leaders of cultures, you know, if we go back to the great philosophers, if we were to look at Aristotle and Ignatius of Loyola, we would find that both of them said something akin to give me a child until the age of seven and I will show you the man. In other words, by the age of seven, they will be so developed that we can predict who they're going to be as an adult. Now, that was taken and twisted by many of the worst leaders in recorded human history. And we have it on record, people like Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini, Mao Zedong, Vladimir Lenin, all saying basically the same thing. 
but having a different intent. And then, of course, we know that children are targets of Satan because where did this idea come from that if you win over a child, you've got them for life? Basically, Satan was the first one to recognize that apart from God. But you look at what Satan does to children in the scriptures, in our culture, in our communities, and we know that our children are targets. Are we willing to step up and defend them? Are we willing to step up and arm them for the spiritual battle that they must fight every single day? And who else is coming after them? One of the studies that I did, we looked at what influences people to think what they think and do what they do. And what I discovered is that there are seven primary influences, not seven, six primary influences in our culture. There's uh, the arts and entertainment media, there's families, there's peers, school, government, and the news and information media. And as we try to assign values to how much influence each of these has on the worldview and the lifestyle of each individual, it's exceedingly difficult. So I'm not gonna start throwing out numbers related to this. But I can tell you proportionally, the arts and entertainment media have more influence on people in America today than all of the other influence entities combined. So you look at all the different media, movies, television, books, social media, computer games, on and on, music, you know, name a medium. They're all part of that thing. And I'm not even suggesting that there's some sort of, you know, big conspiracy that's going on among media leaders, maybe there is, but I don't know that, and I'm not positing that. What I'm suggesting is that what happens is all of these media have dramatic influence on the minds and the hearts of our children. And what that does is it shapes their worldview. And so by the time they're 13, they've watched enough movies with aberrant behaviors with abominable philosophies that are cleverly and subtly woven into plots and the lives of characters and the dialogue that they listen to and the soundtracks. I mean, all the different things they're exposed to. And often they don't even realize what they're absorbing. But make no mistake about it, they are absorbing it. And there's an expression that what goes into a mind comes out as a lifestyle. And that's what's happening with our children. And you'll say, well, wait, wait, the, the list is incomplete. Where, where's the local church? As I did this, I found that there were three different echelons of influence. This is the top echelon, which has probably somewhere on the order of 60 to 70% of the influence on the lives of Americans. There's a second echelon that has 20 to 30%. There's a bottom echelon of entities that cumulatively has about 10%. The local church is in that third echelon. In most people's lives, not everybody's lives, but in most people's lives, the local church isn't really playing in this game. We need to change that. If you're thinking, well, what do I do about the media of children? As we've studied families, one of the things that we found is that the parents and extended families who are working with their children to help them become disciples of Jesus and are effective at that process, there are four things they do with media. First of all, they know what media their children are being exposed to. They monitor it. They're on top of it. Secondly, what they do is they limit it. They minimize it. They put boundaries on what they're able to be exposed to, how much of it they're able to be exposed to. Thirdly, they moralize it. What does that mean? It means that they describe to their children what the messages being conveyed are and whether or not those messages honor God or dishonor God. And then finally, they model an appropriate media balance and life, an appropriate media diet, if you would, for their children. But understand this about most of the parents in our country. We've got real issues, I'm sorry. Um, 
I'm gonna have to move a little more quickly. I get so entranced with all of this, I lose track of time. What we know is that parents often are not strategically engaging in the spiritual development of their children. Why? Because they don't consider it to be a priority. I'll speak to that in a moment. We know that the most popular approach to parenting in America today is what we call subcontracting. And what that means is that our parents love our kids so much and we want them to succeed so badly that what we do is we go out and we hire the best professionals we can to stand in our place and do the job with them whether it's coaching them in sports, tutoring them in academics, dropping them off at a Sunday school at church, whatever it may be, there's all kinds of examples. But rather than parents recognizing that's my job, when I stand before God, one of the primary things he's gonna ask me about is what I do with the children that he entrusted to me. And I can't say I hired the best tutor in town. I dropped them off at a church that I thought would do the job. You know, whatever it is. That's our job. So we cannot subcontract the spiritual development of our children. We know that you know, there's all kinds of forces in the public square that are operating against us. We know that most parents do not have a plan for how they're going to manage their child's spiritual development. It's one of the things I talk about more extensively in that book because I think it's a critical element. If you don't have a plan, basically you're just hoping that it's all gonna work out well. Only one out of every 10 parents in America has a plan for the spiritual development of their children. What we find is that parents are more likely to rank academic achievement and fun and physical health as being critically important than to say the spiritual development of their children is critically important. And so what we've got is a culture where we want to make sure that our kids are smart, happy, and healthy rather than being saved, righteous, and joyful. We look at our parents, and part of the problem is that very few of them actually have a biblical worldview. Why does that matter? Because you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have a biblical worldview, how are you going to give one to your child? How are you going to prepare them to pursue that line of thought, that, that kind of behavior in their life. You don't embody it. You don't characterize it. So it's difficult. And, you know, no matter what group of parents we look at, very few of them really are prepared to do this. And so there are a lot of things that parents get wrong. I don't have time to go through all this. I just want you to know that we've got the data that will show a lot of the deficiencies spiritually in the minds and the hearts and the souls of parents. And a lot of this is in that book. And, and you can get a lot of it online. I've, I've put it up online for free. So you, you can see a lot of it. But keep in mind that if we even just look at our born again parents, what we know is that most of them are syncretists. They don't have a biblical world, world view. Most of them are not good role models for their kids. What are they role modeling? Syncretism. They're not modeling biblical Christianity for their kids. And the spiritual development of their children is not a primary objective. Let me jump ahead a little bit to, I'll come back to that. Where do you start? If you don't have a biblical worldview, or maybe you're a grandparent and you think, my gosh, I don't think my children have a biblical worldview and yet my grandchildren should be discipled by them, how can I help them? As I was doing the research, one of the critical findings was this thing that I call the seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview. What I discovered is that there are actually seven very simple biblical beliefs that if you own all seven of these beliefs as, as a, a critical part of who you are and how you live, 83% of those people go on and, and demonstrate that they have a biblical worldview. But if you reject even one of those seven cornerstones, the probability of you having a biblical worldview drops all the way to 2%. So these seven elements are critical. What are they? Very simple things. That you believe in the God of Israel. 
with all his attributes and characteristics that you know what they are, you believe them, you know why they're important, you know how they relate to you and your life. You believe that human beings are sinful from birth. It's part of our nature and that every choice we make has consequences. And in fact, the only way to overcome our sinful choices is through Jesus Christ. He is the only salvation that we can hope for. Believing that the Bible is the true and reliable and relevant word of God and should be our, our primary moral guide, if not our only moral guide in all of life. Believing that there is absolute moral truth, not only does it exist, but it's been codified for us in the pages of scripture. Recognizing that success simply means consistent obedience to God. It has nothing to do with money, houses, toys, reputation, anything else. It's just consistent obedience to God. And knowing that life's purpose is to know, love, and serve God with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I learned that in Sunday School 101. Did you? I mean, you, you heard it, but, but did, do you own it? Can I look at your lifestyle? And I don't matter. I do. Would God look at your lifestyle and say, yes, he or she really owns that? These are the seven cornerstones. What a great place to start. Is this a full biblical worldview? Absolutely not. But it's an incredibly solid foundation on which to build. If you believe these things, then putting the rest of the elements of a biblical worldview on top of that makes so much sense. It all fits together. This is a great starting place. So I would suggest that, that you consider that. Um, one final thing. It's 7.30. I'm supposed to jump off stage now, right? Can I take like five more minutes? It didn't actually matter what you said. I'm going to anyway. So um, where did I put it? The book that I'm doing on discipleship, the, the work I did for Raising Spiritual Champions and the upcoming book, I looked at, okay, so what helps somebody to be an effective discipler of others? And first of all, let me set the stage. Do you know who makes disciples? Disciples, exactly. If you're not a disciple, you're not gonna make a disciple. Okay, you're gonna reproduce you. And if you're not a disciple, you're not gonna produce something that isn't you. You can only give what you have, you can only reproduce who you are. And so, uh, uh, I could go on a lot for that, but let's talk about what makes discipleship work. Number one, it's not based on a program, it's not based on a reading list, it's based on a relationship. You have to have the relationship with the person that you want to disciple, which means that they have to know you, they have to trust you, and you have to invest a lot of time in that relationship. And then we also know that effective discipleship typically is through a one-on-one -on -one relationship. What I've found, at least in my research so far, is that it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship that builds somebody up to be a disciple. So classes and, and big events, you know, all the discipleship conferences and stuff, they're great at transmitting information. Nothing wrong with that. That can be helpful, but it doesn't create a disciple. It may give some of the tools that might facilitate that, but let's not confuse the two elements. You know, you've got to have a plan for how you're gonna go about doing this. You've got to uh, base everything that you're doing on the Bible. Don't think that you know better than God. God knows. You know, the, the, the greatest example of discipleship that I think we can find is Jesus. Look at the three years he spent with the 12 yahoos who had nothing going for them, okay? And he turned them into a revolutionary force that turned the world upside down because of the relationship through which he invested in them intensely for three years. Not just telling them things, but showing them things, doing things with them, alongside them, encouraging, I mean, just follow his model. That's the discipleship practice that works. But along the way, what you're gonna be doing is intentionally developing a biblical worldview. Why? Because the person you're discipling is gonna be making decisions every moment of every day. 
and they're going to make bad decisions if they're not basing those choices on God's word. And so help them to develop that biblical worldview. Uh, you can do that through stories. You can do that through the example of your own life. You model that for them. That's a key part. Uh, another element that's critically important, particularly with children, is, is what we call Socratic dialogue, which means you will not be effective if you, if you just keep telling them what to believe and what to do. You will be effective if you have a conversation with them and they distill for you what they believe or what they're planning to do, and if it's unbiblical, if it's not the appropriate way, you ask them a question about it. You don't tell them they're wrong, you don't send them to their room without supper. You ask them, why do you think that? And you start to figure out, first of all, where did that come from? What's influencing them? Secondly, why do they believe that? And then you get the opportunity to interact with them in an ongoing conversation about why that is not the best approach for them to take. And, and when you build a, a catalog of these kinds of conversations with your children in their minds and hearts, it begins to take shape. It begins to take the shape of a disciple. A, a, a shape that could not happen if you simply criticize them and scold them and punish them or, or batter them with information. That in and of itself doesn't work. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about your mindset. If I had done a survey with all of you before you walked in the door and said, who are you? How do you identify? Not sexually, but, but just who are, how, how would you describe yourself to somebody? I've done this with different churches, different groups, college campuses and stuff. Very, very, very few people down low single digits few describe themselves as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know that when Paul wrote about Jesus died to give you a new identity, that is your identity. That's what he died for, is for you to be his disciple, his follower, someone who will die for him, someone who will do anything to honor and respect and please him and advance his agenda. So, you know, I, I, I suggested this at a few places. I don't think it went over too well, but you might think about getting yourself a business card that has your name, your phone number, your address, and where you put your title under your name, put down Disciple of Jesus Christ. And pull out that card once a day to remind yourself who you are. Because that is your identity. When you go to work, you're not going to work as an engineer. You're not going you know, around the house uh, uh, primarily as a parent. You are doing it as a disciple of Jesus Christ who happens to be engaged in engineering or you know, sales or whatever it is that you do with your time. I'm not downplaying that. That's great stuff. But keep in mind who you are and how you do it, the, the frame of mind with which you do that. Something else for you to think about, you get what you measure. We all measure stuff all the time. I have found very, very few people, again, who actually measure their own lives in terms of their worldview, their discipleship activity, and the people that they're working with, how they're doing at discipling them. Maybe we can talk about that another time, but, but start thinking about how do you determine if you're successful as a disciple? How do you determine if you're successful as a disciple maker? What's the evidence? When I ask that of churches, they say, well, look how many people we have come to the church. You know, but, but, but you know, it's the old thing of, look, the fact that you're in a garage doesn't make you a car, okay? And the fact that you're sitting in a church doesn't make you a disciple. What's the evidence that you're a disciple? How do you measure it? Think, think hard, think deeply about that. So in the end, all I simply want to do is tell you, you know what? We're in a very intense spiritual war in America. 
regardless of what you think about the people in Washington, D.C., they're neither the enemy nor the savior. What we know is that Satan is destroying America. But he's destroying it because the disciples of Jesus are not fighting the battle. We have got to fight the battle. How do we fight it? I suggest that strategically, we fight it one child at a time, one life at a time. For years, I was so depressed doing this research, you can imagine, you know, that, that we were losing. But the Lord opened my eyes to a number of things. Number one, he doesn't need a majority to win the war. So that's not the issue. I mean, you look at uh, Gideon, you know, went up against the Midianites. Midianites, 135,000 people in their army. Uh, you know, Gideon had, uh, you know, a, a significant share, nothing to compare to the 135,000. God kept whittling it down until it was just 300. And then they wiped out the Midianites. Why? Because they had the power of God working behind them. If we are willing to fight God's battle, God's ways for God's purposes to advance his kingdom, he will fight the battle for us. But my closing thought to you is, we need to make more disciples. The only people who can make them are disciples. If you're a disciple, go make disciples. Thank you.